Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, the ABC and, and D's of Medicare from Sensible Financial Planning. Today's speaker is Rick Fine. Rick Fine has wielded his financial expertise with Sensible Financial since 2003. Rick's knowledge of financial modeling, retirement planning, and insurance helps clients organize their personal finances, plan ahead, and realize their financial goals. Next slide. Just want to add in a little disclaimer before we get started. All content is provided for informational purposes only. Opinions expressed here are solely those of financial, sensible financial and management, LLC, unless otherwise specifically cited. Material presented is believed to be from reliable sources, but no representations are made by our firm as to other parties' informational accuracy or completeness. Information provided is not investment advice or it, a recommendation regarding the purchase or sale of a security or the implementation of a strategy or set of strategies or financial planning advice. There's no guarantees that any statements, opinions, or forecasts provided herein will prove to be correct. Past performance may not be indicative of future results. There is no assurance that any investment plan or strategy will be successful. Next slide, please. And before we get started today, we want to run a quick poll on who is here and who is joining us. So we're going to be starting that poll. And if you can let us know a little bit about your level of experience with Medicare, that would be terrifically helpful. A is I am enrolled in Medicare. B is I am actively researching Medicare for myself or a loved one. I know a little, but not enough. And Medicare is totally new to me. And thank you to everybody who is participating. We're seeing these results pretty quickly. And we can uh, share that poll results in just a moment. We are almost completely filled with that. And then, uh, Rick, we can get you started. All right. And we are going to end that poll in about 10 seconds. So if you want to participate, you can add in your responses. Almost everybody has participated. And thank you very much. We're going to end that poll now and share the results. So, Rick, we have today 32% are currently enrolled in Medicare. 32% are actively researching Medicare. 27% say they know a little, but not enough. And 8% say that Medicare is totally new to them. So take it away, Rick. Thank you, Bobby. And that's a really good uh, 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 distribution. And I think that uh, there will be something in this webinar for, for everyone. Well, hello, everybody. And uh, thank you for joining me today for your discussion of a uh, webinar of uh, Medicare. Um, today, we are going to talk about what is Medicare, um, which would include the difference between Medicare and Medicaid. That's a source of confusion for a lot of people. Uh, we'll look at Medicare uh, at a, a high level, a bird's eye view, to see what all the parts are. We're going to talk about what Medicare, each part of Medicare covers. We're going to talk about what it costs. And we'll talk about uh, the difference between uh, Medicare Advantage and Original Medicare, and whether Medicare Advantage is a viable alternative to Original Medicare. Uh, we'll also give an example of how Medicare actually works when you see the doctor or go to the hospital. And um, also how Medicare integrates with other health insurance. And then um, how and when to sign up for Medicare, because that's really important to know. And uh, finally, we'll look at uh, some sources of help and information for you to do uh, further research on Medicare. 
You probably know by now that Medicare is a hugely complex government program, as most government programs are. Medicare has thousands of rules and almost as many exceptions to those rules. Medicare has many components, each with its own nomenclature. I will try to make uh, some sense out of this alphabet soup that is Medicare. So what is Medicare? So Medicare is the federal government's health insurance system for US citizens or permanent residents age 65 and over or younger if you're disabled. And the definition of a, of a disability is the Social Security Administration's definition, um, which is your condition must significantly limit your ability to do basic work-related activities, such as lifting, standing, walking, sitting, or remembering for at least 12 months. If you fit into that uh, definition of disability, then even if you're not 65, you can sign up for Medicare. Some parts of Medicare are free, others have premiums, deductibles, and or copays. Uh, Medicare is available anywhere in the United States, regardless of your income or health conditions. Once you are enrolled, you can never age out of Medicare. And a really important point about Medicare is that nothing uh, about Medicare, nothing that I describe about Medicare is necessarily true for everyone because as many rules as it has, it also has many exceptions. So it's very important to understand that, um, that your situation may be unique. Also, uh, there's a lot of confusion about the difference between Medicare and Medicaid. I often in conversation hear people talk about Medicare as if they use the word Medicaid. So Medicaid is, uh, it covers medical costs for people with limited income and final and financial resources. It's really for people who are financially indigent. The rules for Medicaid differ from state to state. Uh, Medicaid will pay for long-term care in a skilled nursing facility for those who qualify for Medicaid. Again, if you have limited income and financial resources. Medicare does not cover long long-term care in a skilled nursing, in a nursing home. Um, and Medicaid covers most medical expenses, but may charge a, a small co-payment for some items and services. Medicaid is going to be outside the scope of today's webinar. So let's look at Medicare uh, at a, a bird's eye view. So here, and I'm going to direct your attention to the bottom right where you see this diagram. Uh, Medicare has several parts. Uh, one is Part A, and Part A is often referred to as hospital insurance. Part B is often referred to as physician or doctor coverage. And then on top of A and B, because A and B do not cover all hospital and doctor costs, uh, People who enroll in A and B often enroll in a Medicare supplement, pa supplement plan, which is also called Medigap. And you can see on the upper right, there's a legend here uh, that defines each one of these things. And then fourth, uh, there's Part D, which is the prescription drug plan for Medicare. And then the last, uh, the last box here on the right is, uh, it says not covered by original Medicare. So that would be routine hearing, routine vision, routine dental, things like teeth cleaning, hearing aids, eyeglasses. They are not covered by Part A or Part B or supplement plan or Part D, because Part D is prescription drugs anyway. Now, there's a distinction between original Medicare, which is A and B, uh, and something called Medicare Advantage. And I'm going to talk about Medicare Advantage later. But right now, what you're looking at is what we call original Medicare. So people who go with original Medicare sign up for A and B, they usually get a supplement plan, and they usually get a Part D plan. And under original Medicare, hearing, routine hearing, vision, and dental are not covered. Original Medicare is, a, uh, is, is based upon a fee-for-service model. Fee-for-service is a system of health insurance payment in which a doctor or other healthcare provider is paid a fee for each particular service rendered. 
essentially rewarding medical providers for volume and quantity of services provided, regardless of the outcome of those services. Under original Medicare, there is a nationwide network of doctors who accept Medicare patient, patients, and about 99% of doctors in the country do accept Medicare. Um, and you can see any of them if you want, even if you're located outside of your town or state. If you live in Boston and you have Medicare, original Medicare, and you want to see a doctor at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, because that's the best doctor for your condition, you can do that, and Medicare will cover it. Now, there is also something called Medicare Part C, and that is also known as Medicare Advantage. It is not shown on this graphic. Medicare Advantage replaces the fee-for-service model with a managed care model, such as HMO or PPO, I, terms that you may already be familiar with if you have an employer plan. The managed care model strives to, to, to more efficiently manage the patient's care in the hope that it keeps costs down for everybody, including the patient. I will cover Medicare Advantage later in this presentation, but for now, just keep in mind that there are two ways that you can go when you enroll in Medicare. You can go the, the original Medicare, which is Part A and Part B and the supplement plan and, and the Part D prescription drugs. Those are separate plans. Or you can go with Medicare Advantage. And I'll talk more about Medicare Advantage later. Okay, so let's start with Part A. So Medicare Part A, again, this is known as hospital insurance, although it covers more than hospital uh, costs. Um, Medicare A will pay a large portion of, of the following services. So if whether you're in a hospital or a skilled nursing facility, or even at home, if you have a home, if you're homebound and need uh, medical care, uh, Medicare A will pay a large portion of the nursing care costs in all of those places. And if you're in a hospital and a skilled nursing facility, in particular, Medicare A will cover uh, a semi-private room. It'll cover your meals. It'll cover any lab tests or prescription drugs or medical supplies that are ordered and administered through the hospital. And um, it, is, it is also important to emphasize that Medicare will pay for a stay in a skilled nursing facility only if it is for the purpose of rehabilitation, such as post-surgery recovery, which is usually meant to be a short stay. It won't pay for long-term care uh, in a nursing home, as I said before. The costs of Medicare A, uh, and I updated this for 2024, so these are fairly current. Um, first of all, there's no premium for Medicare Part A for most people. If you have paid into the Medicare system, if you've worked for 10 years, uh, so that means you have 40 quarters of paying Medicare tax, then when you then when you eventually get onto Medicare, there will be no premiums. There is a deductible for Part A when you go into the hospital, and in 2024, that deductible is $1,632. So you have to pay the first $1,632 before Medicare A will cover some of the rest of the costs. And this deductible, unlike most deductibles, is not based on a calendar year. It's based on what's called a benefit period. And that benefit period is on a 60-day cycle. So for example, if you go into the hospital in the month of March and you're there for a week and you then you leave the hospital and then you go back to the hospital in April, 60 days has not passed yet, so you would not have to pay another deductible. But if you went to the hospital in March, stayed a week there, went home, and then went back to the hospital in July, the deductible would reset and you'd have to pay another deductible. There are co-pays um, for hospital stays. The first uh, 60 days in a hospital are on Medicare. They'll pay for that. Stays 61 through 90, your copay will be $408 per day. And, um, and then after that, after age 90, God forbid anybody should be in the hospital more than 90 days, then the costs are, are absorbed. Uh, they're, they're, they're not covered by A, which is, by the way, why people get a supplement plan, right? I'll, I'll talk more about that later. Um, if you're in a rehab, you have a $204 per day co uh, copay 
but the first 20 days are covered by Medicare A. So from 20 days 21 through days day 100, uh, your copay would be $204 a day if you're in a rehab facility. And again, after 100 days, you're you're on the hook for the bill unless you have a supplement plan. Medicare B works a little differently. Now, again, Medicare B is uh, what's called physician coverage, doctor coverage. Um, and Medicare B covers 80%, just a flat 80% of all Medicare eligible expenses related to physicians. So Medicare uh, medical and surgical devices performed by a doctor, diagnostic and lab tests outside a hospital or nursing home, preventive services such as flu shots, mammograms, et cetera, medical equipment and supplies, outpatient hospital treatments, such as if you're in an emergency room, that's all covered by uh, B, 80% of it is covered by Medicare B. Ambulances covered by B. Um, and then also if you're in the hospital, actually in the hospital, not in the emergency room, but you're in a bed, but you're not listed as an, you're not admitted, formally admitted as an inpatient, rather you're held under observation, Medicare B would cover th that stay, Medicare A would not. And that's important. And I'll explain why in a few minutes, why knowing what your status is, whether under observation or inpatient status is very important if you're eventually gonna go to a rehab facility. Uh, Medicare B will cover prescription drugs given in a doctor's office. So not those at a pharmacy, that's what you have prescription uh, part D for, the prescription drug plan. But anything that's, that's administered in a doctor's office, such as let's say, for example, Botox injections would usually be administered by a dermatologist in their office. That's covered by B. Any physical, occupational or speech therapies you might need, covered by B. Outpatient counseling, such as obesity, alcohol, mental health counseling, all covered by B, okay? Now, Medicare B costs, there are many. Uh, the monthly base premium is $174.70, and that's updated for 2024. But notice I said monthly base premium because Medicare B has what's called premium surcharges for anybody who has whose income, whose modified adjusted gross income is over $103,000 if you're if you file as a single person or 206,000 if you're married filing jointly. And modified adjusted gross income is not just earnings. It could be social security, it could be pension income, investment income, any annuity income that you might have, it's all counted. And so even if you're not working, you could easily fall uh, under the, um, the, the premium surcharge. It's called IRMA, um, Income Related Monthly Adjustment Amount. And um, those surcharges can actually add up and they're on top of the $174. There's also with Medicare B, uh, a, a lifetime premium penalty for late enrollment. And I'm gonna talk a lot about uh, when you should enroll in, in the various parts of Medicare later, but just uh, understand that if you, if you enroll late or what Medicare considers late enrollment, you're gonna pay a, a, a pretty hefty uh, penalty. And that penalty is draconian. It's gonna go on for, for, for a lifetime. So you do not wanna be late signing up for Medicare. Um, with Medicare Part B, there's also annual deductible of $240. And this is based on a calendar year, not like uh, A, which is based on uh, the 60 day uh, recycling for the hospital stay. Uh, Medicare B has a 20% copay. And there is no out-of-pocket maximum with Medicare B. So just think about it. If you uh, need brain surgery, uh, that could run you $150,000 between the hospital and the doctor and the rehab, right? And Medicare B is only covering 80% of the surgeon's uh, costs, right? So you're going to be on the hook for the other 20%, and that could really add up. Another reason why people get a supplement plan, because that will cover it. Okay, speaking of which, Medicare supplement. This is also known uh, as Medigap. So anybody who says Medigap, they're talking about that supplement plan that fits on top of Medicare A and B. Again, it's part of the original Medicare that uh, you might be signing up for. 
So unlike parts A and B, which are government administered programs, Medigap is private insurance. And there are many providers that offer Medigap policies. There's, for example, some of the better known ones are uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, Kaiser Permanente, if you live on the West Coast, Tufts Health Plan, Aetna, there are many of them. There's probably over a dozen plans. Um, and Medicare Supplement Plan or Medigap pays much of what Part A and B don't cover, as I said before. It also will cover the Part A deductible, that deductible when you go into the hospital with 1640 some odd dollars, it'll cover those deductibles. It no longer covers Part B dedu deductibles, unfortunately, uh, the $240 a year. Uh, it used to, but after 2019, it stopped covering that. Some Medigap policies, depending on which Medigap policy you get, will cover emergency care if you're traveling abroad, but it won't cover routine care if you live abroad. You must en enroll in Medicare A and B before you enroll in a, in a Medigap plan. And there's something called Medi guaranteed issue with Medigap. And guaranteed issue means um, in the first six months when you sign up for Medicare, you are guaranteed to be allowed to enroll in whatever Medigap plan you want to enroll in. But after six months, if you have not yet enrolled in it, now there is no late fee with a Medigap plan, unlike Medicare B, but if you enroll after six months, you could potentially be denied, or at the very least, you they're going to have you go through medical underwriting. And if they think you have serious medical conditions, they might charge you a higher fee. So that's why I always say to people, when you're looking for a Medigap plan, you want to choose the best policy at the outset that you can afford. Because trying to move up, in other words, if you get a, a plan that you just get it because it's cheap, but you find out after six months that it's not meeting your needs, it's not covering the costs that you need to cover, um, and you try to, to, to trade up, uh, you may not be able to do that, or it's gonna cost you more money. In most states, uh, most states in the country, with the exception of, I think, uh, three states, offer 10 different Medicare, Medicare plans. And to make matters more confusing, those Medigap, I should say Medigap, not Medicare plans, offer 10 different Medigap plans. And to make matters more confusing, they 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 letter them. So it's A through N. They skipped a couple of letters somewhere along the line, but but Medigap plans are listed as A through N, and you get to choose one. And each one of them have different uh, types of benefits, different amount of benefits. The exception to that is Ma Massachusetts, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Um, they have fewer policies. They actually have two or three policies. Massachusetts has three but you're only, most people are only eligible for two of them because one is actually phased out now. Um, and so Massachusetts has the core plan and then it has the plan that is um, to die for, no pun intended. Um, it's, it's, it rivals the best of the, the 10 Medigap plans that are offered by those other states. Uh, for Medigap, the costs are as follows. So monthly premiums, they vary uh, greatly by plan. Uh, it can be, I've seen it $100, $100 a month to $200 a month, somewhere around there. It might be actually a little more. Um, these are averages. Um, premiums are in addition to the Part B premiums and you know, also the surcharges and any penalties for Part B for if you sign up late. So this is a separate cost. Um, and some plans have deductibles and some don't. Okay, uh, the fourth component of original Medicare is Part D. And um, if you recall, I mentioned that Medicare Part A will cover a large portion of prescription drugs that a hospital administers while you are a patient there. And Part B will cover a large portion of prescription drugs that are provided in a doctor's office. Part D, as in Delta, on the other hand, will cover prescription drugs that you purchase in a pharmacy and that you administer to yourself which is about 95% of all the drugs that people take are purchased in a pharmacy. Um, and uh, so the, now there's, there's a, a term here that's really important to understand with Medicare Part D, and that is the term formulary. 
There, there's something called a formulary, which is a list of medications that are covered by the plan. And each plan has its own formulary. It will tell you what the copay is or coinsurance in some cases. Formularies categorize drugs in several different tiers, each of which is its, has its own copay or coinsurance schedule. The lower tiers are often generic drugs and don't cost very much, or in some cases they have no cost. As you go up in the tiers to brand names and, and then specialty drugs, the copays get more expensive. And the insurer can, and the, the insurance provider can and often does change these formularies. They'll change them at least once a year. So it's important to review your prescription drug plan yearly and you can switch plans during open enrollment. And again, I'll talk about the open enrollment period later. Um, you can switch plans if, if need be during open enrollment. Uh, and finally, um, you're, you're under no obligation to purchase a prescription drug plan from the same insurance provider from which you, you purchase a Medigap uh, or a Medicare supplement plan. You can have two different, completely different providers. So let's talk about costs for prescription drugs. Uh, first of all, you have a monthly average base premium. So the operative word here is, is average. Um, I've seen Part D plans that are as low as, I think in 2024, there's one that's going for $8 a month. And then you can get one that's as high as 75 or even more dollars a month. Um, so when I say 55, 50 for 2024, that's an average uh, base premium. The other word, uh, the other term here is base. Now, just as in with Part B, as in boy, um, remember that's the physician coverage, Part D also has surcharges for people whose modified adjusted gross incomes are over that 103,000 or 206 if you're fi married filing jointly. Um, and um, the higher your, your income, the more your surcharge will be. It's not as much as with Part B, but every little bit you know, adds up. Um, and then there are also deductibles and co-pays and co-insurance. Um, and each, pl each plan will have a different deductible and a different copay and coinsurance. Uh, there are also out-of-pocket maximums. Um, and so you want to just, if you're comparing plans, you want to know what those are. And um, just as with Medicare Part B, if you enroll late, there are lifetime penalties for late enrollment. Okay. So now I've talked about um, original Medicare, which is the four components, the A and the B and the supplement and the prescription drug plan. So what on earth is Medicare Part C or Medicare Advantage? So Medicare Advantage is an alternative to original Medicare, where you have separate Medicare, original Medicare, you have separate components, the A, the B, the supplement and the D, a Medicare, a Medicare Advantage program is just one umbrella, right? And the Medicare program pays the Medicare, the, the government pays Medicare Advantage provider a fixed amount of money to cover uh, Part A and Part B and the supplement, et cetera. And they basically say, okay, Medicare Advantage provider. And again, Medicare Advantage is a private plan. It's not government run. So the government will say, here's a lump sum amount of money for each Medicare Medicare Advantage beneficiary. Um, you know, that's the money that you have to provide health care, whether it's hospital care or doctor care, and you better use it wisely. So Medicare Advantage is a managed care program so that they can use that money wisely. But once the government gives them that money, the government washes its, its hands of it. So when you en enroll in Medicare Advantage, you're still getting the benefits of A and B, that hasn't changed, but it's all now under the umbrella of Medicare Advantage. And also the supplement is also under the umbrella of Medicare Advantage, as is Part D, uh, the prescription drug plan. It's now the Part C prescription drug plan. And then finally, Medicare Advantage also uh, will give you benefits for, or most of the plans will give you benefits for routine dental and routine uh, vision and routine hearing. Um, you have to be really careful when they say they're giving you those benefits because um, how much of those benefits are they giving you? For example, 
if your routine dental is only, you know, they're giving you only $500 for a routine dental, well, that's barely going to cover um, a couple of, uh, of teeth cleaning. So you really need to look under the hood on what, you know, how much are they really giving you for these additional benefits. But the bottom line here is that with Medicare Advantage, you're really, you're dealing with one plan rather than four separate plans and you're paying one set of uh, deductibles and copays. So it's, it's, it's easier um, just, just from the, the point of view of paying for it. Um, you still must enroll in A and B and you still have to pay the premiums for, the, for A, for B. Uh, most people don't have to pay premiums for A, as I said. Uh, but with B, you know, you pay the premiums, the base premium, and if there's a surcharge, you pay that. If you enroll late, you pay that. In addition to paying, um, you know, all the uh, deductibles and co-pays and co-insurance for Medicare Advantage. But the um, but the costs, uh, the out-of-pocket maximum for Medicare Advantage is less than or equal to $8,850 $8, in 2024. And I say less than or equal to because each plan will set its out-of-pocket maximum. By law, they can't charge you more. You can't pay more than 8850 but some plans will actually uh, reduce the out-of-pocket maximum. And that does include the, uh, the, B, uh, the B cost, the Part B cost. So a question I often get is, okay, I can go original Medicare with those four separate components, or I can go with Medicare Advantage. You can't do both, it's, they're mutually exclusive. So which one should I get? So it's not really an easy answer uh, to the question, but I do tell people how to think about it. And one way to think about it is to think about all the various criteria that would be important in making that decision. So for example, uh, the first criteria, a fee-for-service model for original Medicare, uh, where the doctors are sort of incentivized to run the tests and send you to specialists so that they can solve your problem. Whereas Medicare Advantage is a managed care plan where you know, it's gonna be a little bit more tightly managed. Access to physicians, uh, anybody who accepts Medicare, uh, if you're on original Medicare, anybody who accepts Medicare patients, you can go to anywhere in the country. With Medicare Advantage, it's uh, usually more limited than that. The um, uh, the local you'll have a local network, and if you go out of that network, either it'll cost more, or with some Medicare Advantage plans, they won't even cover you. Uh, stability of benefits with the original Medicare, the, the 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 benefits for A and B and the supplement plan rarely change. Uh, the only exception is Part D because those formularies change every year. With Medicare Advantage. Everything can change, um, including the network. So some of your, sometimes your doctors will actually leave the Medicare Advantage network, and you'll have to get new doctors. Um, so that that is uh, that could be a problem. Uh, prior authorization that's a huge uh, issue, um, and that's probably the most important criteria to consider here. With original Medicare, there's almost never prior authorization if you want to see a specialist or if you want to have a test run or an MRI or whatever. With Medicare Advantage, there's almost always a pre-authorization required. And the problem with that is because it's managed care, there's somebody in, in the administration who's never met the patient who is deciding whether it's medically necessary to go see a specialist. So that is a, a deal breaker for a lot of people when they're considering Medicare Advantage. The level of complexity, uh, admittedly with original Medicare, it's more complex because you've got those four separate things that you're dealing with, with different coverages and, and prices. Uh, with Medicare Advantage, it's all in one plan. Scope of benefits, uh, there's with me original Medicare, there's no coverage for routine vision, dental, or, or hearing. With Medicare Advantage, uh, most plans will now give you extra benefits, but as I said, you have to really look under the hood and see just how much money they're giving you for that. I, I suspect it's not as much as they, they might claim. Um, out-of-pocket expenses, um, the higher, the with original Medicare, the premiums will often be higher, uh, but potentially lower uh, co-pays and out-of-pocket because of that Medicare um, supplement plan. With Medicare Advantage, uh, there's often no premiums for the Medicare Advantage plan, but there could be potentially higher co-pays and out-of-pocket expenses, again, up to that maximum of 8,400 or whatever. 
So the bottom line on this decision about should I go original Medicare or Medicare Advantage, Medicare Advantage may be acceptable an acceptable alternative if you like the idea of low or, or no premiums, uh, are willing to seek prior authorization before seeing a specialist, if you don't mind finding a new physician or if your current physicians are not in the plan's provider network or, or if they leave the network, um, and also if you like the idea of extra benefits. So I would say, you know, read the fine print carefully before signing up. Uh, you might be interested to know that in 2023, approximately 50% of all Medicare enrollees were enrolled in Medicare Advantage. I think a lot of that in my, in my, my hunch on that, I don't have any hard data, but my hunch is that um, there may be a lot of people enrolled in Medicare Advantage because Medicare Advantage is very heavy on the advertising. If you tune into MSNBC or CNN or Fox News or any other major channel, it seems like every commercial advertisement is around Medicare or every other commercial advertisement is around Medicare Advantage. Uh, so they're really pushing it uh, very strongly. But again, you really need to, to read the fine print before you sign on the dotted line. Okay, so um, this is not a one, a one, or a one and done um, decision. You can uh, switch between original Medicare, and here I'm going to I'm going to show you this diagram here. Call your attention to the diagram on the left side. If you include A and B here, on the left side is is original Medicare. That's the A and the B and the Medigap and the prescription drug, and on the right side is again A and B, but you know Medicare Advantage, which has the supplement and all that. Right? Um, you can do one or the other, but you could switch. Um, and there are, there are different enrollment periods in which you can make these switches. Um, and it depends on what you're switching from and what you're switching to. So for example, there's something called open enrollment, which um, is from October 15th to December 7th every year. And in fact, we're right in the middle of open enrollment because at the date of this seminar, of this webinar is October 26th. Um, during the open enrollment period, you can switch between Medicare, a Medicare Advantage plan and original Medicare. You can also, if you're already on original Medicare, you can switch between two prescription drug plans just by going to a different uh, private insurance provider. Um, you can also switch between two Medicare Advantage plans. If you don't like the one you're in, just find another company that is offering one that you do like. Then there's something called the disenrollment period, which is January 1st through February 14th of every year. In that disenrollment period, you can only switch from Medicare Advantage to original Medicare. You cannot go in the other, in the other direction. Then there's something called the, the special enrollment period. Now this is not, the special enrollment period or SEP is not based on a calendar, uh, the calendar. It's based on a, a, a situation. It's situational, I should say. So um, some of the common situations would be if you permanently move outside your plan's service area and you were enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan, and remember, Medicare Advantage has these networks in your local area, but if you move outside, if you move out of state, you're obviously going to need to find a different Medicare Advantage plan. So you could do that. That could happen any time of the year, and that would be you qualify for the special enrollment period. Also, if your Medicare Advantage plan, which is abbreviated by MA here, um, if your Medicare Advantage plan withdraws from the service, uh, the service from your area, then you're entitled to find another Medicare Advantage plan and you, and you could even go to original Medicare if you wanted. Um, and then finally, if you lose coverage from either a COBRA or if you were on an employer plan and you got booted off the plan or you got laid off, or same with a union health plan, um, then you would be, you'd qualify for that special enrollment period and you could make the changes that you need to make. Now there's one a change that is a little bit different here. If you are, if you are currently in enrolled in a Medigap plan, again, you're on uh, Med, original Medicare. And so you have a Medigap plan and you don't like that Medigap plan and you want to change um, it could be a problem. It depends. So in the first six months, remember you have guaranteed issue, right? Guaranteed that you can switch. But anytime after that first six months of being in the Medicare program, if you want to switch between Medigap uh, plans, you're going to have to go through some, some amount of medical underwriting. 
they will ask you some health questions. And it is possible in some states, not all states, but in some states, it is possible that you might be denied enrollment in in the plan that you want, especially if you're trying, especially if you chose a Medigap plan that was low cost just to save money. And then after the six months passed, you decided that, well, it's not meeting your healthcare needs. You need a plan with more benefits. Um, in certain states, that could be a problem if you have a serious health condition. They'll either deny you, or if they don't deny you, they'll charge you more money. Um, there are 12 states in the country, including the state of Massachusetts, my home state, where there are no such limitations. You can still switch. You don't have to worry about medical underwriting. Okay, um, I'm just gonna go back one second. And I'm gonna say um, that again, if you're in a Medigap plan, uh, when you first sign up for a Medigap plan, you want to make sure that you sign up for the most the most benefits that you can afford just for that uh, just for that guaranteed issue expiration reason. Okay, so now I've explained um, all the different parts of original Medicare. I've talked about Medicare Advantage as an alternative. Um, now I'm going to take you through an example of just how Medicare works when you have uh, medical costs. So I'm going to use uh, this this gentleman named Max uh, as an example. So Max is a 67 year old man uh, who isn't feeling well. Um, he 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 has Medicare. He enrolled in Medicare at age 65. Um, so um, Max calls an ambulance, which takes him to the hospital, emergency room, and they run an EKG, and it shows that he is having a heart attack. It's in progress. And the lab test confirmed this. Max, uh, the doctors rush Max to an operating room for a procedure to remove the heart blockage. Max is admitted as an inpatient of the hospital. He stays a few days. They give him oxygen and meds to prevent clotting and stabilize his blood pressure. Max, as it turns out, is gonna be okay. They caught it in time. Now he must spend a few days in a rehab facility to undergo physical therapy. When he gets home, Max undergoes counseling sessions to help him stop smoking and lose weight. His cardiologist then pre prescribes medication to lower his cholesterol. Okay, so Max has, as it turns out, he has original Medicare, uh, Part A and B, and then a supplement plan and a Part D prescription drug plan on top of that. So now a billing Rube Goldberg machine, a very complex machine to do simple things ensues. So let's take a look. Let's start with part A. So part A covers a portion of his nursing, the nursing services while Max is admitted as an inpatient to the hospital. It covers his semi-private room. It covers all meals in the hospital. It covers EKG and lab tests. It covers prescription drugs that were administered by the hospital, not the ones he got from the pharmacy. And then it covers expenses while he's in the rehab center. Part B covers 80% of the ambulance, emergency room services, the attending physician's bill, the, the physician that did the operation to remove the blockage, even though it was done in the hospital, Medicare B is, a, is doctor coverage, so, the, so it would be billed under B anesthetist services, oxygen while in the hospital, counseling services to help Max stop smoking and lose weight. And Max has the supplement Medigap plan. So that covers the Medicare, the Medicare Part A deductible, that's $1,640 I mentioned, and the remaining costs that uh, Medicare B doesn't cover, other than the Medicare B deductible because the supplement plan no longer covers Medi Medicare Part B deductibles. And the nice thing about this is that um, Max actually never gets a bill for any of these services. The doctors in the hospital bill Medicare um, directly and whatever Medicare A and B don't cover, they send it on to the supplement plan and the prescription drug plan and those they'll pay the, the difference. So that's how Medicare works. All right, switching gears a little bit. Um, how do you enroll in Medicare? So it depends on the, the, uh, the part of Medicare that, that we're, we're talking about. 
So let's just talk about Medicare A and B. So if you are currently receiving social security benefits or you're applying for social security benefits, you're gonna be automatically enrolled in Medicare when you turn 65. Um, and, um, or if you have a qualifying disability and you're on social security, you're gonna be automatically enrolled in Medicare. You don't have to contact them, they're gonna contact you. If you're not on social security or applying for it, then you need to contact not Medicare, you need to contact the Social Security Administration. So it's a little confusing to start on Medicare, you have to contact and you have to enroll through the SSA, the Social Security Administration, not through Medicare.gov. You would go to SSA.gov. You can enroll right on the website. For most people, it's simple and straightforward. Um, you could call the SSA, you could go down to a local office, you'd have to make an appointment. They're usually Six, six weeks backlog. So you want to give it a lot of you know extra time. And in general, if you're going to enroll in Medicare, you should um, uh, start the process uh, two or three months before you actually start Medicare because Medicare needs time to process your applications, set, set you up in their system and mail out the, uh, the Medicare card. Now, if you're enrolling in, Medigap, in a Medigap plan, Part D plan or or if you decide to go Medicare Advantage as an alternative, all of these things are, are private plans. They're not through the government, so you wouldn't enroll through the Social Security Administration website. Instead, what you do is um, you find the plan that meets your needs. Uh, you contact the plan provider. Again, that might be Blue Cross or Aetna or any of those uh, plan providers that provide Medicare, Medigap, D, or Medicare Advantage. Uh, and then once you have enrolled, you have to enroll in A and B first. Once you have enrolled in A and B, then you can enroll in one of the one or more of these plans. Okay. And the objective is to have coverage for all of this start at the same time because you don't want any gap in coverage. So you want to give yourself enough time. Now you don't need to give the Medigap provider or the Part D provider or the Medicare Advantage provider. You don't, you, don't, you don't need to sign up three months in advance. They, they operate much more quickly than the government does, but I would say about a couple of weeks, um, you should contact them. Okay, now, um, what if you're already, what if you already have health insurance, and most people do, um, and you turn 65? So it's gonna depend. So if you are enrolled in market, what's called marketplace coverage, uh, also known as Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act, um, you, when you turn 65, you cannot keep Obamacare. You have to drop this coverage and you have to enroll in Medicare right, right when you turn 65. Um, this is called your initial enrollment period, IEP in Medicare lingo. The IEP has a seven month window to sign up for Medicare before you start incurring late penalties for parts B and parts D. The seven month window includes three months before the month you turn 65, the month you turn 65, and three months after the month you turn 65, seven months. It's not a lot of time. Um, the late penalties, if you don't enroll for the first time, uh, are draconian. So part B, if you enroll in part B or D after that seven month window, there is a 10% um, uh, penalty in your uh, premium for every full year you delay. So if you delay five years, you're gonna have 50% more, you're gonna pay 50% more in the base premium, not the surcharge, not the uh, surcharges or the or anything like that, but just the base premium, you're gonna pay 10% more for every full year of delay. And this is for life. So do not sign up late. Uh, part A, um, again, Part A, you don't, most people don't have to pay a premium for, for Part A. If you've paid into Medicare for 10 years, then there is no premium. But if you haven't paid uh, uh, into the Medicare system uh, for 10 years, then there may be a Part A premium and uh, those, um, those, those, those have penalties as well. They're not as draconian, they don't last for life, 
So they're not as much of a concern. It's really the B and D that are the concern. And again, as I said, 99% of the people uh, don't have um, don't have to pay premiums for Part A anyway. Okay, now what if you are in, enrolled in your employer's health insurance plan, not Obamacare, just the, the group plan that your employer provides? So it's a little more complicated. Um, if your employer has fewer than 20 employees, in most cases, you must replace your employer coverage with Medicare when you turn 65. You will be um, uh, turned, turned away from the group plan. Um, if your employer has 20 or more employees, you can postpone med enrolling in Medicare until you leave your employer, even if that's after age 65. So you could, you could keep on, if you just keep working until 68 or 69 years old, and you're happy with your employer plan, you don't have to enroll in Medicare. When you uh, when you eventually do enroll in, in Medicare, that'll be something called the special enrollment period for people who have uh, who had insurance through their employer. Um, you'll have eight months after you leave your employer plan to sign up for Medicare uh, Part B and A if you haven't already signed up. You might actually wanna sign up for A even if you're gonna keep your employer coverage when you turn 65. There's nothing, if you if you don't pay a premium anyway, it doesn't cost you anything. And uh, you part A would just be considered um, supplemental, uh, secondary uh, coverage to your, to your group plan. Uh, but again, once you retire, you'll have eight months from retirement to sign up for part B before you, they consider it late, late enrollment. Now there, is, there are some exceptions to that. Uh, there are some, some governmental jobs, uh, civil service jobs, for example, that allow you to choose the government's FEHB health plan. That stands for Federal Employee Health Benefits. Um, it's a pretty good plan from what I've heard. Um, you can choose to stay on that and you can do that as a replacement to Medicare or you can even do it in addition to Medicare. And in that case, I believe the FEHB would be the primary and the Medicare would be the secondary. If you choose uh, not to go on Medicare, just know that after eight months, if you later decide to take on Medicare, they're going to consider you a late enrollee. So make that that make that choice wisely. Now, there are many employers who provide retire what's called retiree health benefits. So if your employer has a retiree health plan, uh, and that would be they would offer a Medicare supplement, uh, a Medigap plan, or a prescription drug plan, or or also sometimes Medicare Advantage plan, usually at a discount to former employees who retire. Um, you can purchase uh, this coverage once you sign up for A and B. So you have to sign up for A and B before you can have before you can sign up for any of these other um, private plans. So finally, uh, we come to um, how can I get help choosing a private Medicare plan? Um, in this webinar, I didn't try to give you everything that you ever needed to know about Medicare. It's just the program is way too big. You're still probably going to need to figure out, you know, which Medigap plan you want, or which which uh, prescription drug plan is best for you, or which Medicare Advantage plan if you decide to go that direction. So there are several ways that you can get more information. One is that you can do your own research. You can talk to friends, family, and colleagues, um, some of whom probably uh, are already on Medicare and they've probably done a lot of late, the legwork for you. You can also go on to Medicare's uh, website, which is medicare.gov. They have a pretty nifty um, application, online application, right on the website. It's called Plan Finder. And you can you, you plug in your zip code, and then you answer some questions about your health needs and your preferences for plans. Um, and, um, and then you can actually even put in your prescription drugs, uh, the dosages and the frequency and the name of the drug. And what Plan Finder will do is it, it will display for you all of the plans um, that are available to you in your area, uh, all of those private plans. It's not A and B because A and B is the government uh, the government coverage, but certainly for uh, Medicare Advantage or, or or original Medicare, the private plans. Um, it'll it'll give you a list of all the plans. The one thing it doesn't do, I believe, is it doesn't give you the cost. So. Once you find a plan that you think you might like, then you wanna probably find the provider's website and go on there and get the cost or you can call the provider. 
Well, if you don't want to do your own research, um, you can go to the State Health Insurance Assistance Program, Assistance Program, or SHIP, SHIP. Uh, every state has one. Um, they're called different things. I think in Massachusetts, it's called SHINE, which stands for um, Serving the Health Information Needs of Elders. But it's still the same kind, it's still the same program, the SHIP program. Uh, this program is free to, um, uh, uh, it's it's basically free to you, um, and it's staffed by volunteers. There are over 12,500 Medicare certified counselors. Some are better than others. Uh, they offer assistance, counseling, and education to Medicare eligible individuals like you. Um, and, you know, they'll probably use Plan Finder as well. It's not just for the end user. A lot of counselors will use Plan Finder. Then there are these independent licensed Medicare agents or brokers. These are um, commissioned uh, salespeople. So they're free to you as the Medicare enrollee, but they're paid by the local Medigap or prescription drug plan or the Medicare Advantage provider if you enroll in that provider's plan. Um, you need to be careful. Uh, you know, Medicare has some strict rules uh, on which these people can operate. They don't always follow the rules. So you wanna ask some pretty good questions and just know that um, uh, they, the commissions that they get on the back end are much higher for enrolling you in Medicare Advantage plans than they are for enrolling you in a Medigap or a prescription drug plan. It's not to say that, you know, they're, they're not operating on the up and up, but um, a lot of these people will push Medicare Advantage. Um, and so you just wanna be, be aware of that. Just ask them good questions. Um, and then finally, if you have a complicated situation, uh, and most people don't have really complicated situations when they sign up for Medicare, but if your situation is very complicated, it involves COBRA, you might be going through a divorce where your, ex, your soon to be ex-spouse uh, has a, a group plan and you're on that group plan, but once the divorce is finalized, uh, you're going to be bumped off the plan. Or if you have some, you know, really uh, serious health conditions and your medications are very expensive, there's just a lot of complexity there. You might want to find a fee-for-service Medicare consultant. And these are Medicare experts. They're actually healthcare experts, but they also do Medicare. Um, you, you pay for them. They're not cheap. Um, and, um, but they may be best if you have a really complicated case. So, um, so those are the four ways, um, that you can, um, that you can get more information on Medicare. Okay. So that wraps up our, um, our webinar on Medicare. Um, there, we are planning some future webinars because again, I couldn't tell you everything there is to know about Medicare. We'd be here until next Tuesday. Um, but we are working on webinars for to go into more depth about the, the finances around Medicare. How much will it really cost uh, when you add up all of those costs? And there, um, we, I will probably give you some scenarios for that. Uh, will you have to pay Medicare surcharges? And what, what on earth is IRMA? And IRMA, again, is the, it stands for Income Related Monthly Adjustment Amount. That is the surcharge if your income is over a certain amount. So there's some complexity to that and we'll wanna talk about that. Also, um, there are some big mistakes that people make with Medicare. And so um, we'll, we'll just be able to devote most likely an entire webinar to the 10 biggest Medicare mistakes people make and how not to make them. And then finally, Medicare uh, is going through some changes. Certainly the prescription drug plan is going through a lot of changes. Um, and uh, so we'll uh, we'll probably have a, a webinar on the future of Medicare as well. And even though it says enroll now, um, you know the Medicare is not ready yet, but you will get notification when it is ready, and and we'll have a link where you can register for that. Uh, and something else to note um, coming up on November twenty first, not related to Medicare at all, I promise. Um, is um, managing money as a couple, thinking about marriage and the finances around marriage. And Rick Miller, uh, the CEO and founder of Sensible Financial will be conducting that webinar. And again, that will be November 21st. 
And if you haven't already registered for it, uh, I would highly encourage you to register. It's going to be a, a, a great webinar. Okay, so if there's any uh, time left, Bobby, I'm going to turn it back to you, and we're going to take some uh, we're going to do some Q and A. All right. So we do have many, many questions, and Rick and I talked about this ahead of time, and said we would stay over to answer some of those questions. So understand if people have to leave, this will be recorded. But at the same time, we're going to try and roll through a whole bunch of these questions. So, Rick, the first question we have is, what is late enrollment? Well, late enrollment, again, um, it, 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 it relates mostly to Medicare Part B and Medicare Part D. And in some cases, Medicare A, but most people don't, don't have premiums for A, so, so there won't, would be no such thing as late enrollment. But again, for for if you have if you are enrolling for the first time in Medicare and you don't are not coming from an employer plan, then um, you have only seven months to enroll in Medicare, and that seven months is is the three months before the month you turn sixty five, the month you turn sixty five, and the three months following the month you turn sixty five. There's that seven month window where you need to enroll in Medicare um, A and B and D, or if you're gonna do a Medicare Advantage plan, you have to at least enroll in Medicare A and B in that seven months, or, or uh, you're gonna be considered late, and then you're gonna have surcharges. If you're coming from a employer plan, um, you don't have to enroll when you're 65, but when you do leave that employer plan, even if it's after 65, you have eight months to enroll in Medicare before you're considered late and you're going to incur penalties. Okay. Our next question, you said that Medicare covers about 99% of doctors. Many psychiatrists seem not to participate. Any suggestions for accessing mental health care? Yeah, that is a um, that is an issue. Um, and, you know, that has a lot to do with how um, the mental health profession is treated by insurance companies. There's a lot of red tape and they often don't get paid on time and they often don't get paid what they would like to get paid. And so a lot of mental health professionals have just decided not to take insurance. And so they're leaving it up to people to um, submit those claims to Medicare on their own. Okay. Our next question regarding Medigap and trade up or changing to a different plan at a later date. Is the risk of medical review underwriting still an issue at every annual open enrollment period? Yes, because the Medigap plan does not has nothing to do with the open enrollment period. You can you can switch Medigap plans anytime you want as long as you can get the plan that you want. Right, so it's not, it, there's no window for that. But it is based on your, it will be based on your health after the first six months, that guaranteed issue period. Okay, our next question. I heard initial premiums are from MAGI, which is the Modified Adjusted Gross Income, for anybody who doesn't know, based on your last two years of income when you first enrolled, is this true? It challenges us newly enrolled moving from a job's higher paycheck to social security. That's a great question. Um, and I, 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 I neglected to mention um, uh, the viewers is absolutely correct. So when Medicare is calculating your Medicare Part B premiums and your Medicare Part D premiums, um, they are looking at uh, two years of uh, two years prior income, right? And they'll get that from the Social Security Administration, right? And again, they're looking at um, they're looking at actually maybe not the I don't know where they're looking, maybe more than Social Security, but they're looking at all your income, right? But they're looking two years back. So if you are coming from a job and you're now your income is going to be a lot lower now that you retired. You can actually petition, petition uh, in the year that you retire, you can petition Medicare to not look two years back and to only look at the, the current year income. 
So that's a, that's a very I'm glad that the the viewer pointed that out. Yes, and uh, there there is a petition form, and that's located. I think it's called SSA forty four, and that's you can get that on the SSA.gov website. It's, cha it's called a change of life petition or something like like that. Change of life event. Our next question. I heard initial premiums are from Magi based on your. Le oh wait a minute, we did that that's one. Let's try that yeah. again. <laughs> Um, next one is I enrolled in Medicare Part A when I turned 65 in May. I did not enroll in Part B or D because I had coverage through my large employer. In January, I will lose my employer's coverage and want to enroll in Parts B and D. Can I enroll new for a January 1st start date? Will I be subject to underwriting for my Medigap plan if I enroll after I lose my employer coverage? Or is there a grace period after I lose, lose my large employer coverage? Okay, so this is a very particular situation. Um, I, you know, it's it, I can't give a definitive answer for every particular case, but just from what I'm hearing, it sounds to me like this is a very common situation that when you turn 65, you're on an employer plan, you and you can enroll in part a there's not you know it's not going to cost you anything because there's no premiums for a for most people um you don't have to enroll in b or d when you if you're if you're happy with your employer plan but when you do retire then you would go on b and d and um that's the special enrollment period that i was talking about there will be no late late uh, penalties for it there may be a surcharge right? If your income is higher, but there won't be any uh, lifetime late penalties. Um, and also um, there are no penalties with um, Medigap plans. So you don't have to worry about that. And you shouldn't have to go through medical underwriting. Um, if you, if they, if the Medigap plan knows, and they will know that you're coming off of an employer plan. So that, that won't, that won't apply. Okay. Um, this next one is saying, can I be denied based on health in this situation? If I want to switch from Medicare Advantage to original Medicare parts A, B, and Medigap plan, might I be denied based on my health, a pre-existing condition? I don't believe so uh, if you're doing it through the open enrollment period. Next question, can a spouse who has not worked and paid into Medicare for 10 years still get Medicare if primary income earner is qualified for Medicare? What about a divorced spouse when married at least 10 years, similar to the spouse's Social Security? Uh, that's a different issue. But if a married spouse, yes, uh, um, they would be eligible even if they didn't have their um, uh, 10 years. Uh, a divorced spouse... Um, I don't know. I'd have to look that up. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> There's a lot here. And by the way, folks, we are sending out a special resource document with the recording. So you will be getting some additional information and information in writing as well as getting the recording. Next question. So after enrolling in A and B when 65, you will automatically be enrolled when 66, i.e. nothing more to do and need to do to go to the Social Security Administration website and sign up for A and B again during open enrollment. I, I'm not sure I followed that question. I'm not sure I did either. Was that even a question? It was a question, but I think they were asking if you, there was anything else you needed to do when you enroll in A and B when you're 65? Like, do you uh, need to do it again the next year? No, 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 it's, uh, it's it'll continue. Um, you just enroll once um, and they'll send you a Medicare card. And, um, but you know, you wanna, you wanna think about not just A and B, you wanna think about the supplemental coverage or, or a Medicare Advantage plan, obviously, you know, or or a prescription drug plan, because because A and B, if you just sign up for A and B, it's not going to cover you for everything. But no, you don't have to keep signing up every year. You do have to pay your premiums, but you know, for for B, right? All right. Um, and we also got asked if the 
says this apply. I'm not exactly sure what this was. If your spouse has health insurance through an employer. Medic? Does what apply? It says, does this apply? If your spouse has health insurance, this, this may have been referring to a particular point in the presentation or one of the previous questions. So we can look at the previous questions and see if there's something from this particular person and there is not. So maybe we can clarify that question. Um, so we'll skip that one for the moment and see if we can get a clarification from yeah, our I think, audience. I'm members. wondering if the question had to do with the previous question about if if a spouse has an employer plan and they go off the employer plan and they go on Medicare, can they can the non-working spouse? So so the one thing to keep in mind is that um, Medicare is an individual enrollment, right? So um, so yes, the, 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 the spouse who is not, who was not part of that plan uh, can all, can sign up for Medicare, but they have to sign up themselves. They can't, it's not like they would go on, uh, their, their spouse's plan. So they, the, each, each spouse has to sign up for Medicare A and B. Each spouse has to select their, uh, Medigap plan or prescription drug plan or the, or the, um, uh, and, and also, uh, the two spouses should not necessarily have the same plans because they have different. They may have different health conditions. So don't don't think it's easier to just both sign up for the same plans because that that is not in your best interest necessarily. You want to make sure that the plan is appropriate for your particular uh, health needs. Okay. Our next question is: If I move to Europe for retirement, can I put Medicare into a reserve mode and reactivate it if I move? back to the u.s in the future um i i think there may be a way to do that i know that it won't pay when you're living overseas uh there may be an exception where you move back that they won't charge you a uh, a penalty um i believe that is the case okay might need to be double checked on that one um next question what if you're not working and turning 65 and you have insurance through your spouse's company plan? Do you have to drop coverage through the spouse's insurance and enroll in Medicare A and B? Or can you stay in your working spouse's plan until he or she retires? Well, again, it depends on the, the number of employees that, that uh, of the company that the spouse works for, right? So if, if the spouse works for um, under 20, uh, oh, actually, um, no, I think um, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure. I have okay. to check on there, And we'll take these questions afterwards. And um, if a person's name is attached, we can send emails. So uh, if you have asked a question anonymously, I can't uh, access the email attached to it. All right, next question regarding Medigap and trade up or changing to a different plan. Uh, we actually, I think we got that one already. Um, if you or spouse does have health insurance, do you need to file anything with Medicare to let them know why you aren't signing up for Medicare to avoid the penalties? Can you repeat that question, please? Sure. If you or your spouse does have health insurance, do you need to file anything with Medicare to let them know that is why you aren't signing up to avoid penalties in the future? Well, it will ask you that on the SSA website. Okay. All right. Um, let's see here. I think we, oh, where we go. Uh, where to get info about F, E, H, B, and Medicare criteria for deciding whether to take F, E, H, B, and Medicare or just F, E, H, B alone? Uh, well, if you Google it, uh, you'll certainly have a lot of information on it. Um, you might actually be able to go to the Office of Personnel Management, OPM website. Oh, I guess it's opm.gov. Um, so those would be the two places I would look. And, okay. and also, you're, also, if you work for 
an employer, if you work for the government, which is probably why they're asking the question, the government's, um, the government, uh, the, the, your HR administrator should have information on FEHB. Okay. Um, we have, uh, we have some people that have actually joined late and yes, we will be sending out the link to the webinar as well as some resource documents. So just so you know, uh, next question, I moved to Portugal where I enrolled in the local social program. Is there any merit in applying for coverage in the U S when I spend less than two months a year back in the U S no. Okay. That one was easy. Um, let's see. Regarding Medigap and the potential for medical review in the non-guaranteed issue 12 states, is switching from a plan G, high deductible plan, to a plan G plan, a medical reviewable event during annual open enrollment? I don't know the answer to that. I know that um, Plan G is one of the more comprehensive plan uh, Medigap plans, um, but I don't know if you'd have to go through a medical review if you're going from high deductible to not. I just don't know the answer to that. Okay, and we do have a clarification on that earlier question. Um, they are looking to find out if you have coverage through your spouse's work, do you avoid having penalties by not signing up for Medicare by 65. So no, if you're if if you're um if your spouse can stay on the um uh can stay on the employer plan, uh then you can stay on that plan as well. And when your spouse retires, uh then you would just pick up Medicare, you would just go onto the SSA.gov website, you'd apply for for Medicare A and B, you could pick your your uh, private plans on top of that. Uh, but you will not be uh, uh, you'll not be penalized for that. All right, Rick, I think you did it. Went through the uh, the questions. If I did miss one, my apologies. Uh, you do have the link in the chat, folks, for signing up for the next webinar. And if you signed up on Eventbrite and checked off uh, that you want to receive information from Sensible Financial, you will be receiving additional invitations to future webinars. So thank you again. Thank you, Rick. Terrific job. And that concludes today's webinar. Thank you, everyone. Take care.